cleaned up for, for the rest of the year. Before we get to tonight's program, just to tell you about a few things happening here at the library. A couple of weeks. Um, this coming Friday, we have someone who has been at the library before. Patricia She will join us for a celebration of uh, Pete Seeger. And a um, 100 years old, so we'll celebrate Pete's, Pete's 100th anniversary, which is kind of cool. Uh, also, Friday, May 17th, our Live at PWPL series, live music continues. The Zach Brock Trio featuring the snarky violinist from the band Snarky Puppy. They are going to be truly incredible. Uh, the improvisational work is going to be wonderful. So please come down for that. The next installment in this series uh, will be Susan Werner, who will be here on June 1st. And our dear friend John Platt will return to interview Susan uh, for the upcoming episode. So uh, we're going to be streaming live over the interweb, as I always joke, for this episode, as we do for all the episodes of Inside the Musician's Mind. Um, I always say that they, they don't really know how many people are here tonight. So when I say we're live from the Port Washington Library, just pretend there are 10,000 of us and get really loud. Okay. <laughs> there you go. So, okay. So, I'm going to look up. I'm just going to look up to. Are we get thumbs up. We are live. Port Washington Public Library. Yes. For, for this month's installment of Inside the Musician's Mind. Good to see all of you here. All of you back up on the lawn up there. It's great to see you all up there. Just five, ten thousand of us gathered here tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm going to switch microphones because this one's bloody. So let's do that. And let me grab this one instead. There we go. Also, make sure that our special guest's mic is turned on, and it is. Okay, great. So. Uh, the format for this evening's show is based loosely on a show called uh, Inside the Actor's Studio, for those of you who are familiar with that, with a nod to the questionnaires of James Lipton and Bernard Pafoe and Marcel Proust, who did it before Mr. Lipton. And on a personal level, my approach to uh, talking to our guests is sort of based in part on uh, my dear friend, the late disc jockey Pete Fornatel. I hope to do them both justice. So as a lifelong music enthusiast and a historian, I often wonder what makes my favorite musicians, arrangers, composers, performers, lyricists tick. Why do they do what they do? How do they best do what they do? Basically, what goes on inside a musician's mind? So I plan to venture into what promises to be an interesting, fascinating, possibly unusual place. And on every trip, I hope to take all of you along with me. So without further ado, let me talk a bit about our guest this evening. Our guest for this episode is a noted drummer, percussionist, humanitarian, teacher, and inspirational speaker. Matt Wilson was born in Knoxville, Illinois, studied percussion at Wichita State University. He moved to New York City in 1992, and since then he has worked with many other greats in modern jazz. And he has released 13 albums as a band leader. His latest recording, Honey and Salt, music inspired by the poetry of Carl Sandburg, was recognized on over 30 worldwide best of 2017 lists. The album was also voted record of the year by the Jazz Journalists Association, where Matt was also voted 2018 musician of the year. Matt's own recordings and performances are really only one aspect of his life's work, which seems to me to be promoting music and jazz in particular as an art form and inspiring young musicians to take on the challenge of creating and performing music. Would you please welcome to the stage Mr. Matt Wilson. Is that in a good spot for you? That's perfect. All right. There we go. I'll let you do some adjusting there. There we go. Okay. Thank you. So, um, 
we usually start with some questions that kind of provide us with uh, some insight to how and why you do what you do. And uh, I'll go to the beginning. I'll say, what is the first music that you remember hearing in your life that made an impression on you? The thing that woke you up to the power of music? Roger Miller's King of the Road. And uh, I bring that up a lot because the bass on it is in two, you know, which is a feel in jazz, a swing. I mean, that music was swing. So my, my uh, exposure to swing really was that, was that record. And other th music that was on the television at the time, too, that, that had that kind of time melody to me, that groove. But that bass line is... Trailers for sick. That's right. Yeah. So that, that feel is still what I really love. So one of the things I look for in bass players that I play with is how, how well that they play in two. Cool. So that made a real impression on me. Okay. Now, um, you, you obviously developed an interest in, in jazz music. How important was for you to see live music at a young age and go see live performances? It, it was very important. And um, recorded music was, was important, too, early on, because um, a little backstory: story. I, I was born with, like, severe club foot. So <laughs> I w I've had 27 casts on my left leg, three operations, you know. It's tough to straighten it all out. So one of the things that my mom would do is put stuff around me. Her concept, the reason I played the drums was because she used to put toys around me because I couldn't really get up. I wasn't. I, I learned to crawl a little bit late because of that, though I was crawling with the cast on. But um, she said that the reason that he likes to play the drums is because all that stuff's right there. <laughs> and she'd put on records, <laughs> and I would just sit there and listen to that, the music. You know, we had March records. We didn't have jazz records per se, but we had you know we had this Roger Miller's greatest hits and some like marches and stuff like that. But when I got in uh, middle school, well, junior high, we called it, or, you know, or late grade school, believe it or not in, not, in that area of the country, West Central Illinois, there was a lot of live music. And um, we used to go see a lot of things. My parents were great. I just talked about them, wrote something about them today because they took me to everything. They took my brother and I to everything that we could possibly check out. And so... But I had this buddy in high school or middle school who uh, was also into jazz. So we saw uh, and met Count Basie and um, Freddie Green with the Basie Orchestra. We went to see Buddy Rich in, um, in this same high school, Chillicothe, Illinois. Check this out. In one week, this is West Central Illinois, folks. We drove 50 miles north to the Quad Cities, and we saw Clark Terry, legendary trumpeter. We drove 50 miles south and saw Dizzy Gillespie's quartet with Ed Cherry, Bob Crenshaw, and a very young and great Tommy Campbell. And two days later, we drove down to the University of Illinois and saw Oscar Peterson play solo piano. So here's these two farm kids without the internet web, as you said earlier. And we found out about this stuff because the, the newspaper had a, like a TV guy that came out on Fridays that would advertise what the concerts were in the area. Wow. So we'd circle him and we'd go. So it was pretty great. We were interested. He's a doctor and still a fan of the music, but we, used to, we, we saw all those people. And Louis Belson used to come around a lot because he was from West Central. You know, he's from Moline, Illinois. Yeah. I met Mr. Mr. Belson many times. He'd always see me, always remember my name. I thought that was great. So I tried to do that with young musicians. Very friendly, maybe one of the nicest people in jazz, you know, reputation. Go, been practicing? So yeah, Mr. Belson, been practicing. So it's been great. So he was really great, but we, and then and then I went to these jazz camps and stuff like that. So I found it, you know. Yeah. Cool. The other thing I found interesting is that I was a kind of a victim of 1970s budget cuts, and uh, you know we didn't have a jazz band in my high school because of that. We did it on our own, but I had to go out into the public, and you know I had to get out into the community to learn this music, which was probably better. My brother, they cut the theater program too. He was five years older than me. They cut theater, and he ended up becoming one of the, if not the, you know, most in imaginative uh, scenic designer and lighting designer of the Midwest. And we did all this without that in the schools. 
So it just goes to show me, show you that I think that sometimes when you got to go out and look for it, you, mm. you, 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 you know, you get after it a little bit more. So it's fun, really great. Taking it to the next step. You were going to see live music. You were enjoying recorded music. How did you become involved in music actively? When did you go from being a listener and an appreciator to a creator? Do you remember those first steps and adventures? Yeah, I had a really great high school band director who I still am in contact with, and I'll see him in a month or so. And he, he had a dance band, and uh, he played drums, but he also played violin. So when he had to play the, with the symphony, I would do the gigs for him that night. So I was playing in supper clubs and weddings and stuff like that, pretty young. Eighth grade, I, th I think I started working. It was pretty fun, actually. <laughs> and I thought it was great. You know, I'm around these older musicians sure. playing, playing these gigs, characters, you know. I think that's one of the reasons I'm drawn to is because I was really always into the, these people that are real characters, you know, like funny and interesting. Like we had this guy in Galesburg. He played in this big band I played in. His name was Dave Poole. He was a farmer and a really good writer. He was a really good arranger. But his claim to fame was that he would scat sing using animal sounds. <laughs> That's some avant-garde <laughs> stuff, you know? So his big, when his big feature was um, walk right in, sit right down. You know that song? And he'd do, he'd go, <laughs> and I just thought it was the greatest thing. And he'd make me laugh every time. But he also had he had he had other things going on. So he would be really he was really cool. You know, he was one of the he was like the guy in the the big band. You know, as a drummer, Chris Smith is an ass. He's one of the guys that's in the big band that, were, that was cool to you. You know, because yeah. a lot of times the drummer, you know, you get picked on. Everybody picks on you. But he was one of the cool guys. You know, Dave Poole. And I remember just looking. He had the greatest look when he played too. But he and his wife would be always come to the gigs. And when he would do the animal scat singing, I just watch her. She just roll her eyes like, oh, here's. It was fun. <laughs> But we had a jazz festival in my hometown, too, which next year is celebrating in Galesburg, which is next year celebrating its 40th anniversary. So I was kind of in the cool. begin, begin, in, inside the beginnings of that um, 40 years ago. <laughs> and um, so we had like Dave Freeman, Ed Shaughnessy, Ted Curson. We just when I, was, I got to play with Joe Pass at that festival. So, th yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, it was fun. That's there there cool. was a lot going on. I always say that that area out there is agriculture with a capital C. You know, that's just because it's farm doesn't mean we don't have, you know, things going on. So it was, it was hip. Is there still, a, I mean, the festival is still on. Festi yeah, next year is the There's 40th a anniversary. Yeah, scene happening there, too? Oh, everybody lives. knows it. That's great. Yeah, everybody that's knows great. it. Every time they, they play the festival, my aunts go and get their picture taken with them. So this year it was Mark Giuliano's band was there, so my Aunt Carolyn's with Mark Giuliano. L last year it was... Um, Two years ago, it was Gretchen Parlato, Anat Cohen. My aunt has her picture uh, with uh, uh, Maria Schneider. Um, everybody that comes through, they go because they, I know everybody that's coming to play <laughs> the festival usually. So they go and talk to them, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you're coming." And I set them up every once in a while to say stuff to the people just to get them riled up. Like my good buddy Jeff Hamilton was playing in town once, and he's a great, great drummer, but he doesn't really like this symbol that's called a flat ride. So there, he was taking some uh, uh, questions from the audience, and my aunts go, "We notice you don't use a flat ride in your setup." <laughs> and he goes, "You're Maddie's answer, aren't you?" <laughs> so, so you know, that I've helped. Brilliant. I've helped bring. You know, uh, it's been nice to see. Uh, there's another residency in that area in that area for the ja for jazz, and I think I mean, it's been nice to sort of play a part in helping people come back for that. So sure. yeah, I'm very sure. proud of it. I know that you've worked with so many different people, but is there anyone you could cite in particular who you think was the greatest influence on you as a musician? It's, it's difficult to, to do that, but I would have to say probably uh, Dewey Redman, the great saxophonist. I don't know. I just, I, I've worked with Dewey. I work, I played with Dewey. I mean, it wasn't work. For 12 years, uh, I, I first joined him in December of 1994, and I played with him until the day. I was with him the day he died, which was September 2nd, 2006. So it was great. I learned a lot about sound. I learned a lot about presentation. I learned a lot about trusting musicians, how to put on an evening of music that was interesting. One of my sons, I have triplet sons. They just turned 18. I have four children. And one of my triplet sons' middle names is Dewey. So I'd say he's pretty important. You know, absolutely. And it's not a day I don't. I probably learned more about sound from everything uh, from him more than just about anybody else. You know, it's just sound production. You know, it's like, so he was, yeah, really yeah. great. 
to, to work. But Charlie Hayden, a lot. Uh, this weekend I'm playing with um, and recording live with Denny Zotlin's trio. We've been together 18 years. That's with the great Buster Williams. So that's always been, that's been a lot of fun too. Those guys are great, you know, and, and fun, you know. And Lee Konitz and Joanne Brackeen and Carla Blake. There's a lot, but I would say Dewey probably just because I – you know, I did my first European tour and all that kind of stuff with him. So it was like a kind of a nice, nice feeling. In the early years when you were just getting started and, and getting into the, the field, was there someone who sort of took you under their wing, you kind of like a mentor or someone who was really Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of those too. Yeah, I've been really uh, uh, grateful for those. I had a great college teacher who I, I had a great – actually, I've had people all along the way. I've been really fortunate not to have anybody be um, – negative really and I speak with a lot of musicians a lot of times they've had a lot of negative things and I was pretty lucky not to have somebody you know I mean I had tough love when I needed it you know when I was thought I knew what I was doing and I didn't um but for the most part I've had pretty positive reinforcement but I went to school at Wichita State University which was fantastic and I was with a for not, I didn't know I didn't really learn I mean we learned jazz on our own there too which again is probably a good thing you know but I had a percussion student named J.C. Combs, who's maybe, if not the most imaginative person I ever met, up there with one of the most imaginative people I ever met. We did a crazy pieces there. We did a piece called War Games by Walter Mays, which was a concerto for uh, percussion ensemble and professional wrestlers. I kid you not. <laughs> and this man, and the place would be packed, you know? I mean, usually percussion ensemble concerts, you'd be you'd be better off just staying home watching the paint dry. <laughs> Nothing against it, but, you know, but he made them really interesting, and he got a lot of people there. And these things were sold out. We do these crazy things. So he's been a real influence about just the answer is yes. That was kind of his thing, you know, try crazy stuff. Yeah. And also set yourself apart. You know, I've always been around. My parents were that way. My brother, my, my late wife, all uh, my children, all these people have been always been people that have encouraged me to just be myself, you know. And now I have a new person in my life that's encouraging me that too. So it's great. You know, it's nice to have people, you know. And I tell my students all the time that Herbie Hancock says, nobody remembers the people that follow the rules. Or Eleanor Roosevelt said, we don't remember uh, ladies that behaved. So, you know, like you have to, you have to be people, that, you know. And so that's why I still am out there trying to do things all the time. And my middle brother who passed away a couple years ago, he was maybe a greatest hero for that. He was a, we were schemers, you know. We got on the phone and just talk about crazy stuff to do, and we'd still even when we were kids, we're like let's try this, let's do this, and we'd come up with crazy stuff to do. We played duo. We used to play saxophone drum duo, like on stages like this. We'd set up, play at 4-H meetings and PTA meetings, and we had shtick and everything. We do comedy. <laughs> It never changes, really. It's the same old. But we were, we were, we were, we had. I think we kind of had a cool act going. I wish we was. I wish YouTube and all that was, you know, Everybody back had. then. You know, we would still love to just see five minutes of that would be great. But uh, yeah, it was. He was really important. A very, very important guy. Now, we've thrown a few, a uh, few names out, and actually, one of them that's on this list. But I'm going to throw a couple of names at you. Okay. Tell me the first thing that comes to mind when I when I say them. Max Roach. Composition. I watched the. I was just talking to uh, a colleague of mine at the New School today, the great Cecil Bridgewater, about a video a student of mine just sent of Mr. Roach yesterday, and I was just watching Mr. Roach play the drums and how compositional it was, and how he was looking at the drums and things were just emerging. Like you know, it's very compositional, thematic. You know, themes, way beyond you know, uh, you know, way beyond just art, but thematic, very thematic and very compositional. Louis Belson. Joy. Pure joy. And he played with, he was Duke Ellington's second drummer, and Duke Ellington played his music. That's pretty heavy, you know? That is. Yeah. Louis Belson, sweetheart. One of the, if not, again, one of the nicest people ever in the business. Reputation wise, you know, one of the greatest. A member of the Long Island Music Hall of Fame, Roy Haynes. <laughs> Perpetual. I mean, I we just saw we saw we didn't get to see him last week, but we just spent time with him uh, for his 94th birthday, and we saw him. Uh, my girlfriend Kim and I saw him play last uh, fall, and I was in tears. I went a little bit of trepidation. It wasn't going to be what it 
you know? And not only was it not that, it was as great as the first time I ever saw him play 30 years ago. I was just, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And, and the, he, he's a master of playing a song. You know, he plays the song so great. And the way he just dances there, but the way he hears and plays the song, it's, there's nothing like it, you know. There's nothing like it. And, the, you know, his d energy and his dancing. When we were just at his house for his, you know, with having some champagne with it for his birthday, I got back in the car and I told Kim, I'm like, I'm kind of shaking. I was like, all the people that he's been around. Like, he's the greatest living American musician, by hands down. There's nobody that's, a, you know, b that's done the multitude of stuff with all those different people and all those different worlds, you know, as, as Roy Haynes. I mean, Lester Young. You know, Lewis Russell, Charlie Parker, you know, uh, Ro uh, just Stan Getz, Sarah Vaughn, Duke Ellington, John Coltrane, Pat Metheny, Chick Corea, Ray Charles. I mean, the list goes on and on. Thelonious Monk, you know. I mean, uh, uh, pivotal records by everybody, you know. I mean, I'm, list I'm leaving out, you know. When I interviewed him, I interviewed him once in a public interview. You can see it on, on YouTube. And uh, it was a joy. And... I, I turned it around. I, I, instead of asking him who he's played with, I asked him, let's talk about the people that have gotten to play with you, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it was true. I mean, he, uh, it's, a, it's a real, you know, he, I talk about someone who was unique right from the beginning, too. I mean, Lester Young heard something in him, and, uh, you know, that recording in 1947 that, that he made, the first recordings that he made with, with, with him were just unbelievable, really yeah. great. And he's a local guy. Yeah, too. yeah, he sure is. I, I remember hearing a story about you bumping into him in the market. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you see him in the grocery store. And I check out everything that he was buying. And I bought it, too. <laughs> soy, soy milk, grapefruit juice. I'm like, write it down. And as he was leaving the grocery store, I said to the people, I said, right there, is the, that's the world's greatest drummer right there. Leaving this, leaving. And this person said, oh, that want to check out people. said, oh, yeah, we, we, th we thought he was something. I said, oh, he's something, all right. <laughs> he's something. And uh, last year I helped with, uh, uh, with the help, help of my uh, dear friend and our county, legis our county executive, Laura Kern. We, uh, last year we made it um, Roy Haynes Day for his birthday, his nice. 93rd birthday last year nice. in, in 18. So that was a really nice honor, and, and uh, we're so happy that we could be part of that. So That's very nice. Cool. Elvin Jones. The element. Uh, uh, m my late wife used to say she loved Elvin Jones, and she used to say there's rain and snow and sleet and wind, and there's Elvin Jones. She did, it was like an element. And she loved to go see Elvin play, and one night he kind of he really flirted with her because she was a violinist, and he shook her hand, and he said, uh, what do you do? And she said, are you a sculptor? She said, she said, no, I'm a violinist. Oh, really? So they got done with the set, and all the drum nerds are up there getting some stuff signed or whatever. And he kind of parts them. He looks at her, and he goes, baby, now you play Flight of the Bumblebee for me. You know, he just, <laughs> just laughed. But the elements, yeah. And, and, and again, also just the, um, the joy of, uh, 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 of, of sound. You know, and you, know, you knew who it was. And also, I, I would see him places. You know, I went to a record date of his once. That was great. And, but you would just, I'd see him in Europe in a hotel lobby, and you know, even if people didn't know who he was, they knew he was something. You know, he just has that, you know, Elvin Jones just had this presence that was Wait, pretty deep, and a really beautiful human being, really nice guy. He'd hug you, you'd know it, you know. It was great. It's like, <laughs> 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 he was great. Now, you, you made mention of another great drummer a little while ago, and I know you, you met legendary Buddy Rich a few times. Buddy had a reputation. Uh, how did those meetings go for you? I mean, you know, everybody thinks of Buddy Rich. and you, you know. The first one didn't go so well. Um, I was young, and, I, and I, didn't, I didn't hear the instructions that he was going to sign the autographs on the bus. So I went up to him with a Modern Drummer magazine or a record or something, and he yelled, I said I'd sign the autographs on the bus. So my, my friend and I were standing there, and I think there was a puddle down below me when I looked down. <laughs> but my last encounter with him was pretty cool. It was the summer of hmm, maybe 86 I saw him play in Hutchinson, Kansas. And I went on the bus afterwards, and I have this record of the, uh, that was on Mercury Records called Buddy Rich Sings. And he's wearing a, he's wearing a jacket like this with a... With a 
with a button-down shirt, and he's and he's on the cover like this. Literally, this picture. <laughs> he sings. Um, I know. I know he sings. Uh, uh, it's been a long, long time on there. He's a really good singer. Kiss me once and kiss me twice and kiss me once. It was really good. So I, I went on and I had it, I put it in front of him, and he goes. He goes, you see this picture, kid? I said, yes, sir. He goes, this picture should have never been. <laughs> and he signed it, and he, he laughed. He smiled. He says, enjoy it. I said, I really like this record. He goes, yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But it's. <laughs> <laughs> How unbuddy rich can you get, and that, really? And that night, it was great because he played a lot of trio. Nice. Piano trio within the band. And uh, he was, oh, man, it was great. It was really, really, really beautiful. So. Yeah, he, you know, uh, yeah, I think he could be an okay guy. You know? <laughs> Good memory there. <laughs> but, I, yeah, he was, it was always astonishing to see. I saw him once at the University of Illinois. Uh, uh, we were at the Craner Center where we saw Oscar Peterson, and I was lo we were in the balcony over the bandstand like this. So let, let's say where that microphone thing is. That's kind of where, where, right below here. That's where he was. And he played this, this, this solo on the snare drum. That was one, it was as if it was as, as if I saw Heifetz or somebody. On the snare drum, it was just unbelievable. A great sounding hall to do it. I think he knew that, so he was just oh, it was great. It got down to like this. Yeah, yeah, it's unbelievable. He was fascinating. For a fascinating, time. yeah, and it's just an interesting history, right? The showbiz life, the vaudeville life, the what he knew about the American. I mean, he was a walking history of American entertainment, you know. Wow. Other than just jazz, you know, he was like vaudeville. Growing up in the vaudeville world and all that, hmm. he knew all the comedians. He knew all the dancers. I mean, he was, you know. Something I was else. always told, just don't ask him about country music. That was like one thing. That I think yeah, <laughs> they asked him if he they asked him when he was on a gurney. I think I don't, I don't know if he was having a heart attack. And they said, "What are you allergic to?" He said, "Country and western." <laughs> <laughs> Never heard that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk a bit about about collaboration. Um, your work is based so much in part on the uh, on the wonderful collaborations that you bring to it. When you meet or hear the music of a fellow musician, what for you initially ignites that desire to want to work with them? Play with them, as we say. It, it, it may sound simple, but sound and feel, and those two are kind of combined. I can trace back to everybody that I play with. I can trace back to the first time I play with them. And I remember how it felt, you know? The people that I, that I have, you know, really in my crew of bands, you know? I can remember it. Jeff Letter, I can remember it was a high school in somewhere in Brooklyn reading band. This cat stood up, I was like, what, what's this? This is great. Terrell Stafford, uh, IAJE Conference in New Orleans. Kirk Konufke, Andrew D'Angelo's band, excuse me, Andrew D'Angelo's band at the Tea Lounge. Uh, Chris Lightcap, some little place on 48th Street. Um, you know, I can just keep going and going. Gary Versace, I remember the first time I played. Larry Goldings, I remember the first time I played. I remember, you know. So, Ron Miles. I mean, I, all these people, I can just continue to listen and listen. I can remember exactly what it first was. So, I think I always tell students, you know, you, I think your initial, the, how the time, how you share the time is probably, that's how musical relationships are created. You know, I don't remember the notes they play. But man, I can remember their sound, and I can remember how it felt, you know, and that joy and enthusiasm that, that they convey, and, and that's why, you know, like okay, I want to be involved with that sound, you know. So that's why I keep those people involved. Usually, it has a lot to do with too the that they're open and joyful, you know. I remember the I Paul I hired Paul, a young bassist named Paul Sakivi, who was part of the Christmas Trio, which is next year's this year's celebrating our tenth anniversary as a band. Who would have thunk it? We only work a month a year. But anyway, um, <laughs> thankfully. And uh, no. <laughs> but I hired him for like a nursing home gig. He was recommended by my dear friend Frank Kimbrough, another great uh, great artist and great pianist. And we were playing. And he, after the first tune, I said, what are you doing in October? Because I had this quartet stuff I needed a bass player for. He, the, after the first tune, I was like, I just dug the way it felt. I dug his enthusiasm and the way he was vocal about it. I was like, OK, what are you doing? And, then, and he said, oh, listen, let's talk. And it was great. That's great. Great. So it's yeah, it's very important. It goes right to the heart, obviously. Yeah. For you. Martin Wind. I can remember the first time I played. We played together all the time. Great bassist. You know, I can remember that. It was a place up in, off of the Hutchinson Parkway in Connecticut. 
with um, the late, great Carla White. And, uh, and I can remember how it felt. It was just like, wow, this is great. So, yeah, I can pinpoint it to all those places. Now, you, you mentioned the Christmas trio. And uh, let's look at a couple of the other ensemble projects that, that uh, you've done. How did, how did Arts and Crafts come about? Well, Arts and Crafts came about because I'd had the Matt Wilson Quartet, and uh, we've been touring and stuff, and I kind of wanted to have a different project to record with. And I, it kind of started out really maybe as a repertoire, to, like songs that I had, you know, that I wanted to do that were m maybe from more of the jazz canon or, you know, American songbook standard standard canon or whatever like that. And um, so the first Arts and Crafts record was with, I, I built the band basically around Dennis Irwin and then, uh, I and then, ter and then the great bassist, late great bassist, and then Terrell and piano on the first record. Who's he's a brilliant pianist, you know. And so um, that was fun, and we toured, and we were playing in Chicago. So they had a Hammond. So you know, he's he's a great organ player. So he played Hammond along with playing piano. So on the next record, we you know we had him play both. Yeah. And then Gary Brisset took his place because Larry got a gig. You may have heard of this singer. His name is what's his name? Uh, Taylor. He's pretty good. James Taylor, I think it is. No, he's still he's in Vegas right now with James, you know, at that residency. So, you know, it was kind of hard to get him moved to the West Coast. And, he, and you know, he still does gigs with us. That's the great thing about all those bands, you know. Joel Fromm, the great tenor saxophone player, that's somebody else I left out. I can remember the exact night I played with the first time. First two notes with Joel Fromm, I can remember, like it was yesterday. It was just like, wow, I'd never heard someone feel like that playing the tenor saxophone. So he's still, you know, we all do this stuff together. Yeah. Once you're a family, you know, it's a family unit. You yeah. know, you, you, people come, we, we can just use different people all the time, so. It's fun. A unique project, all the projects you do are unique, but a slightly different project, I love the name of this, is the Either Orchestra. <laughs> How did that come about? You know, it's funny, I just, I just hung out with Russ Gershon, the leader of that band, a few weeks ago uh, at a Seder um, that we attended, and, and I hadn't really listened to those records for probably 15 years, 20 years. So, you know, everything's online. So I, I was listening to it, I was like, man, this band, uh, it was really good. I mean, I'm not that I was doubting that it was good, but I listened to it and I was like, man, we really had a vibe going on this with this band. Yeah. And um, yeah, we, we toured. You know, we would go out. We were out a couple times for six weeks, 10 of us with a road manager. We'd go all over the place. We had, we had a 15 passenger van with a trailer, and then this little Toyota van. We had names from, we won't. I won't disclose what the nicknames <laughs> were for the vans. But this was before the internet and everything. You know, we didn't have cell phones. So I, was, I did a little, I did a little uh, panel discussion at the Jazz Congress about touring, and I was the oldest person on the panel. So it was Helen Sung and Marquise Hill and Emma Cohen. So I was like, I'm the elder guy of this. I said, I, I brought it. We didn't have it. We, we used triptychs. Remember that, you guys? Remember? Triple A triptychs. AAA. You'd tell them where you were going to go, and we had, these, we had two boxes of triptychs. So we'd be out, you know, in the middle of Arizona, we'd be going through the triptych, you know, and <laughs> you know, and we'd stay, oh, man, we stayed hotels. And one time we got to a hotel somewhere in, I think it was in Cedar Falls, Iowa, and uh, they had a sign uh, in the shower that said, no foul cleaning, because it was a duck hunter's hotel. <laughs> <laughs> we, we went everywhere. And, I, and the reason that I think I got, you, you know, we did that, you know, and we were one of the pioneers. I have to really be proud to say that we were one of the pioneers that brought some of this music back to America. I mean, America, because people weren't touring in America in the late 80s, early 90s. And so because of that, that's how Modesky, Martin, and Wood, and a lot of other people got started because John was in the band, and they, we realized that there's places to play in America. So thank God for, you know, Russ Gershon and that band, but it was really fun. I mean, we still laugh about it. I mean, we have films of that stuff. I mean, yeah. videotapes. I mean, if that stuff ever comes out, we're either going to be really proud <laughs> or, you know, want to change the names or put those little, you know, things over our black things over our faces <laughs> or, or garble, the, garble the voices. <laughs> I remember the time. <laughs> like one of those, you know, uh, crime <laughs> movies or something like that. But I was just, w there's more stories with that band. Than just, and I can remember everything. So I'm kind of like the band historian. So I can remember, like, what we ate, you know. There's a lot of stories. I mean, we... We drove, we would, oh, it was really fun. We just go all over the country, you know, played all over the place and, and did it, you know. And again, I'm really proud of it. And people have come out of that band, you know. Uh, 
Medeski, Andrew D'Angelo, Bob Nesky, uh, uh, MacArthur winner, Miguel Zanon. You know, I mean, a lot of people got a, a start, you know, from this band. So I think it's, I think, I don't know how many years now, but at 30 some years, I think the band has been in existence. Pretty wow. cool. Yeah, it's cool. Now, we talked a little bit about the, the Christmas Trio project, and it kind of leads me to a question about uh, the, the joy of in, interpreting songs between the, the, the standards, the Christmas songs. Songs that are so well loved, well known. How different is it to approach a project like that than it is to put a project of original music together? Yeah, the, um, there's a lot of there, there, actually there's a lot of uh, there's there's a lot of um, creativity in the ordinary, you know. So sometimes it's really great to see what people will do. So I'm still intrigued to watch people to to hear what people are doing with something that I know. And that's why we play the blues, you know. I mean, we know the blues, but when you hear somebody else and they put a, their own thing on the blues, you know, that's pretty great. So it, it's fun to do that. And, and um, I think it all comes down to imagination but in both regards, you know, presentation and imagination. But I think it's really, I, I, I like that. I like that challenge of figuring out, how, you know, how, how are we going to do, uh, you know, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, or how are we going to do, the chipmunk song, or how are we going to do the Messiah, you know, the uh, the hallelujah chorus from the Messiah, you know, which we did with timpani and everything, um, you know, and, and and you just try it and you and you do it, and and I like I still like that. I mean, w I teach at the San Francisco Conservatory, and we were doing a, a chapter last week when I was out there uh, on um, on early Miles Davis quintets, and you know, Miles Davis. I mean, we, I, I, it's hard to say that, it, but at times we can, I, I, we can, I don't want to say it, but we can take it for granted, like just how great he was. I mean, a genius, you know, so great. And, and uh, uh, not that we take it for granted, but I mean, just, wow. And what I love about him is that he, he found, I, I just want to know more about his, how he discovered all this repertoire that has become. Like, why did he choose Someday My Prince Will Come? You know, why did he, how did he choose... Surrey with a fringe on top. How did he, you know, so he had a real ear for, for deciding, you know, John Coltrane also with My Favorite Things or Chim Chim Tree. I mean, like, I think that's genius that, that they can find songs too that, and see, you know, what they can do with it so people can kind of enter their world through the familiar and see what someone can do with it, you know. So I think that's a, a, that's a nice thing that we can do as jazz musicians along with you know, the original music. Think about Hunting Assault was my first record, really, of, of the records I've done as a leader, where it was all of my compositions. You know, I've always, you know, I've been a repertoire gatherer. So I do mine, you know, maybe it's half and half, maybe it's a third, and or maybe it's more, mostly mine and some, but to have it all be uh, my compositions, you know, though they're theirs once they play them, they're not really mine, but uh, was was a was a fun challenge to do, so. Yeah. You, uh, a little bit earlier, you mentioned uh, your wife, Felicia. Yeah. And so on a serious note, on a slightly sadder note, um, you lost Felicia in 2014, the mother yep. of your four children. Uh, she was also a musician, a teacher. In 2016, though, you released an incredible and beautiful tribute album called Beginning of a Memory that was, that was dedicated to Felicia. How did taking on a project like that help you to kind of overcome all the grief, the loss, and and what did all the the accolades that you got for that album mean to you? Well, I mean, it was a it was a good bridge, you know, to something to another zone, you know, of 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 dealing with things or moving through it. You know, you don't really, you know, you move through this stages of stuff, and so we, you know, it was great to gather the, those folks together from all those bands and do that, you know. It was kind of everybody that's ever played on one of my records. Yosuke Inoue recorded a solo in Japan and sent it over for, you know, for uh, in the middle of Go Team Go. He played the, the Victory Dance uh, song, which was um, uh, Endless Love, Lionel Richie. And, uh, but it was all these songs, too, that Felisa loved in that band and, you know, from the different records. And uh, it was, yeah, I just felt like it was needed. It's something I needed to do. And um, she was such a great musician. I mean, she could hear everything, and uh, and she had a. Uh, uh, I was I tell uh, musicians this all the time, like especially high school musicians, college musicians. 
as jazz musicians, we have to realize what the form is of songs. We have to be, we have to, we're, we're really taking in the awareness of the whole composition a lot of times. Well, we, hopefully we are. But there's a lot of times where there's musicians that just read the notes from one corner to the other. A lot of classical musicians, I'm not putting them down, it's a beautiful thing, but a lot of times they're not aware of the forms with what's, what's within it. And she could tell you everything that was going on. Oh, this is the exposition. This is the, re you know, this is the return of that theme. This is the sonata form. This is, and she had a, some great teachers for that, one of which was Robert Kopp, one of the founding members of the Juilliard Quartet she studied with at New England Conservatory, who would make us, make us, but especially for her, but we'd listen to it together, cassettes where he would play music and then talk about the the movements and an analyze things. Well, this is what happens here, and he would play little excerpts. Really great. So she learned, you know, more th beyond the notes, you know, learned beyond the notes and read about the composers and knew and knew the repertoire. So, but she also loved all kinds of music. So one of the pieces that we do on that is a piece that I wrote called The Orchids, which was, we got this orchid right after my after Felisa passed from Charlie Hayden and his wife Ruth, and it was sat on our table for the longest time. So I wrote this theme, you know, from watching that seeing that flower, and Felisa's favorite song, uh, even though she was a classical uh, violinist and whatever, was Wildwood Flower that was made famous by the Carter family. Da da dee do dee da dee da da dee da da, ooh bo bo that song. It's great, and so I put those two themes together for that piece, for that record, and then we I do that with large ensemble and all kinds of things. So yeah, it's a nice thing. Beautiful. Um, I'm gonna go into just some general questions about jazz and music, sort of state of jazz at 208. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but but you had received a, a national endowment grant, if I'm not mistaken, at one point, right? 1984. Now, how crucial is it that that the government, national level, that there continues to be strong support for the arts. It's, it, 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 it just has to be. I mean, uh, if you look at our, what we spend on the arts compared to other cultures, I mean, other countries and other, it's sad. It's sad. And what we get, what we reap from it though, I mean, I mean, I gotta, I think that grant in, 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 in 1984 was $2,200 or something like that, $2,400 or something like that. I studied with Ed Sof, the great drummer and, and, uh, and great teacher, and, and, and I used that money also to see things that summer. I saw Billy Higgins the first time. I saw Ayerto. I saw Elvin Jones and Philly Joe Jones in the same night in New York City. So I think that, that investment by the government, I think I have paid back in multitudes. You know, not just service to the country, you know, service to the country by f traveling the world and playing this music and, and teaching it and talking about it and being a humanitarian for it. That was one of the reasons I was able to do that because I got that money from that at that point. So I, I think it's I think it's key. You know, I think it's and and we we need we need to foster imaginations. I mean, that's what our that's why people come here. Because of our, our imaginations, we you know we've always led with with imagination, and if we don't, if we don't, if we're not fostering that with our own people. <laughs> we might as well just, you know. And I, I hate to say it, but you know, I think it's 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 showing. So I think there has to be. Uh, I, I think I think there's enough support f from the people that will not allow that to 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 to, to, to diminish or at least or go away. I really do, but I think. When it, every year or every time that we have to worry about it, I think it's a shame. You know, we, I don't think we should have to worry about that, especially for what little money it is, you know, from a person's pocket to fund this. It's just, to me, it's, 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 it's just, not, it's not, you know, it's not right. So I think we have to do everything we can do to, to show our support for that and, and, and make sure that we let our elected officials know how much that we benefit from that and how much it's needed, you know, for growth. Absolutely. I know that uh, from a lot of what I've seen, you're definitely not a lover of labels when it comes to music. Do you think that jazz music in recent years has kind of suffered from this sort of niche classification, this kind of micro management of what type of music something is? 
uh, all the genres seem to be hit by it, or is jazz kind of immune to that by its very nature? I'm not so opposed to the to the to the label word at all. You know, some people are, and I respect the people. I respect everybody that has an opinion about that. I'm not going to get in an argument about it. For me, I think it's a music that still welcomes a lot of music and influences a lot of music. I don't think there's any other music that welcomes music like jazz music does. And also, like I said, has influenced a lot of things. You can see that by, I mean, it, it's sort of a sad thing in one way, though it's kind of funny. But, but, but we seem to welcome the people that, from other genres that have been put out the pasture a little bit, you know? I mean... When you look at the new, when you look at the heritage festival, you know some people. You know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's not the right thing to say, but I mean, I think we we still welcome those people as far as the presentation at festivals and stuff, or or just put them on a jazz festival. There was a really great funny um, ad, or there's a like a fake news thing last week that that was pretty funny and said, uh, "People surprise jazz act booked at jazz festival," <laughs> um, <laughs> because sometimes it's not a lot of jazz booked at the jazz festivals, mm -hmm. but then there are a lot of them are. You know, I, I don't. You know, I, I just keep pushing ahead. I mean, I, I don't spend a lot of time really worrying about that per much. I, I'd rather take care of my own yard than worry about it. I mean, I just try to do as much as I can as far as what I do with my own bands and what I, how I am with other people and in my, through the teaching and through, you know, events like this and through presenting concerts and all that kind of thing. So I, I try to, you know, I, I feel like if, you know, Kim and I do have a... a you know, we've done a series of house concerts in our town in Baldwin, and that's probably doing more for the music than, you know, anything else. Like, Absolutely. people that get a chance to come and meet Steve Wilson and Bruce Barth and hang out with them and Frank Kimbrough and Kirk Konefke or Bruce Foreman do Red Guitar or something like that, you know? So just try to help it out rather than sit around and, you know, get on the Internet and complain. I don't, I don't really have too much time for that. You know? I like to complain. No, I'm <laughs> It's just that y y your work sort of, like, just runs the gamut. And and it's just so it's so nice to see that it, you know it doesn't get pigeonholed. But you see some artists that just get put into it. They do this type of jazz. They do that. Well, it's part just, of that yeah. comes from part of that comes from I think, f and I'm proud of it. Part of it, part of it comes from uh, ignorance or uh, you know or not knowing. You know I mean I don't mean that in a negative way. Yeah. Uh, uh, my brother, when I was a kid, got me this great record set, and I talk about this all the time. I'll talk with Chris Smith, the great drummer, who's in the house about it. My brother got me this three record set. It was on ABC Impulse called The Drums. If you ever see these, there's one for the bass, there's one for the piano, there's one for the saxophone. And Ed, Ed, Ed Michelle and Michael Cascuna took stuff from the vaults of ABC Impulse and, and other labels that they, were, they had at that time and put together this record, these record sets. It was three records. So it started with Baby Dodds and it went to um, Barry Allshul with... Um, Anthony Braxton, which was the most modern, as we say in the Midwest, modern, no modern music of the time. So in between was Joe Jones, Sid Catlett, uh, uh, Louis Belson, Buddy, uh, uh, Art Blakey, Philly Joe Jones, uh, Connie Kay, Elvin Jones, uh, Chico Hamilton. And so one of the things that was on there was Sonny Murray playing drums with Albert Eiler. So I heard this Albert Eiler song called Ghosts, and I, would, I remember the day I heard that, I was like, wow, what is this, you know? And I loved it. I thought it was really great. And it was a saxophone player playing completely differently. So I didn't know. I didn't know as a kid that I was supposed to, you know, subscribe to a five-year period of this music and only be devoted to that. So I heard this whole spectrum of the music. So partially that kind of naivete has, has, has allowed me to keep that going, you know? kind of like to be dumb about it in a way. Just like try stuff and not, you know. But I, I, I'm, I don't put one thing over another. I don't, I don't prefer anything over anything else. I'm, I don't rather do, I don't say, well, I'd rather do this or I'd rather do this. I love working with singers. I love playing free. I love playing really tipping music. I love playing large ensemble. I love playing duo. I like playing solo concerts. I love playing trio. I mean, I don't like to put one thing over, the, you know, top of anything else. They all feed you, you know. If like you only do one thing, it's like going to the same restaurant every day. That would be a drag, right? So I like going to, you know, Sonic Buffet, I call it. And just try it, you know, and it's the people that really matter anyway. Not the music, it's the people, you know, the people that you play with. They're the characters, you know. Um, Marcel Duchamp said, I don't believe in art, I believe in artists. So I feel the same way about the music, you know. I believe in the people. The people are what plays the music, yeah. not the style. You know, it's, you know, it's not style, you know, it's like people play 
you know, music. So music is people. No, <laughs> soil and green is people. No, no, but it, it, it is. It's people. You know. So the characters. You know, and who they are. That getting back to the original, what we talked about with sound and feel, and and they're you know just who they are as humans. You know, I mean, I've been around some cr great people, man, that are just beautiful and funny and and. Great human, hu just great human beings, you know. Carla Blay, Joanne Brackeen, and one one day at the L Detroit Jazz Festival, so man, two, you know, two of the greatest characters of this music ever, you know, two great women of this music, really eccentric, you know, but beautiful eccentric. But I love them both, so it's great. One of the things that we sort of have as an advantage, and you you live in New York currently, and in New York we have the advantage of a huge jazz scene and so yeah. many of these characters that that come through clubs where you can hear jazz music your one of your goals you seem to really want to promote the idea of getting jazz into smaller cities and towns and um, you know how do you feel that that endeavor is going and, and bringing bringing that music into areas that aren't as uh, um, you know jazz isn't as prolific as it is here I'm gonna tell you something I was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota last weekend, conducting the Sioux, the South Dakota All-State Jazz Combo. They had two All-State big bands, and I did the combo. And I'd put these young people on a festival in New York anytime. There was this young guitar player. His name is Emmanuel Michel. Write this name down, because you're going to know about him. He is unbelievable. He's been playing three years. He's completely self-taught. He learned by YouTube. Whoa. Un. Unbelievable, unbelievable, and in, and he knows everything that's going on. He asked about all the cats. What was this? What? Who's this? Who's this? What are they doing? So it's happening everywhere, and not only not only these young musicians, but the the the, the people that that I met from the community out there. It, there's a lot of stuff going on. And this year alone, I've been in Richmond. I've been in uh, Virginia. I was down in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. I've been in Boone, North Carolina. I've been in Idaho twice. You know. I mean, uh, yeah, it's everywhere, you know, and the people are, you know, imagination, it, 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 it's, uh, imaginations and and cur courage doesn't come from urban, you know, it's like, you know, it's just yeah. people that want to do stuff and try it out. Yeah. Galesburg, Des Moines, Iowa City, I mean, Indianapolis, Cleveland, I mean, that's stuff happening everywhere, so it's great to see. You know? So with that in mind, do you think that the, uh, uh, the interweb is uh, definitely the contributing definitely. to it? The internet's been jazz's one of jazz's greatest friends, if not, yeah, because you can hear the music. I remember when I was a kid, we'd read about a record. Oh, we got to go get this record. You go to a record store, well, we don't have it, and so you you know, out of sight, out of mind. Now, you know, we can. I don't have my phone, but you can go on right now. And so yeah. you know, we can research, and wi you know, there's Wikipedia in you know things about records. You know, I mean, I I have these students learn more about just the, just the song. You know, like you got to go, you got to learn beyond the notes, you know, so do the research, learn the anthropology, you know, learn history. On the train home today, I was reading all up about Davy Tuff, you know, just checking out some stuff about the great Davy Tuff and how this happened and this happened. And, you know, it's all right there. And so the internet's been really good for us, you know, as far as I, I think. It's probably been one of the greatest things for us and it's also allowed us to know you know, kind of what's happening in places, you know, and, and know, you know, the, the communication thing. Has been, and we also, unfortunately, but fortunately, we can also know when someone has passed relatively quickly, which is not, you know, but we're celebrating these people. So we know, like, wow, the word gets out faster. And we can, you know, I think it's a great thing to honor this music this way. So it's great. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm down for it. It's been a great friend for the music. Now, other than going into small towns and things like that, you've, done so many outreach concerts. You did them through Lincoln Center. You brought music into and bring music into nursing homes and places like that. What has that meant for you as a performer on a personal level? You talked a little bit about people meeting the musicians, but how fulfilling is, is that? Uh, well, you know, um, if it gets, if it, if it sounds in a few people, you've done your job, you know? If, if, if I don't really, I, you know, I don't go there to like, it's not like a revival meeting. I'm gonna, you know, <laughs> convert everybody to the, you know. But I think if they, I think if they understand, you know, I think what people want to meet, know the person. You know, my dad was always great about that. He go, he'd go to the concert. He go, he'd like to watch them before they went on, and check out what they were doing, how they walked out. 
you know, what they were doing at the break. So you get you learn more about the you know the people. So I think what's great about America a lot of times is the musicians. We we seem to do that a lot. You know, Europe is great too. I mean, I love touring in Europe and I do a lot of it and and ever other places too. I love it. But uh, the visiting aspect of things is cool. But I'm pretty social, so you know as you can probably imagine. And uh, but I, I like the, I like the the hang you know a lot. So uh, it's really fun to, to to talk with the people. But I think people really want to get to know the person. I remember when Lester Bowie was still alive and he was he was like the state jazz musician of Vermont. I don't know how they did this. He became like the <laughs> jazz he was like the what do you call it with the poet laureate. He was like the jazz laureate of Vermont. And everybody loved Lester up there. Now here's this guy. My my uh, my mother-in-law who's here, she met Lester Bowie. She uh, they the leaders came to Tulsa and a friend of mine who books it, they went to see the leaders. She met Arthur Blythe, Lester Bowie. And she said, I remember talking to the about she goes, oh, he was the one that wore the lab coat, you know. <laughs> and they hung out with him, you know. She hung out with Lester Bowie and Arthur Blythe, you know, and, 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 and Kirk Lightsey and Don Moye. And Nan and my, my father-in-law were hanging out with these guys. So, and so when, when Lester died, these kids painted the lab coat for him, you know, and he was buried in that lab coat. Isn't that wow. cool? So I think, I think it's just more about getting to know the people. I know the time I was in... Um, Augusta, Georgia, everybody that lived there, no matter who you were, what demographic or what race, it, it was Mr. Brown. Well, we saw Mr. Brown at the airport. I'm talking about James Brown. You think of these, I remember talking to this lady who I thought was probably, you know, like, well, we saw Mr. Brown at the airport. Like, he was revered, you know, like, wow, James Brown was Augusta GA, you know. So, you know, if they start to know the I think that's what's nice about like my community in Baldwin or something. You know, these bring out these musicians and they get to know them as human beings. You know, and and you get to you know my aunts got to meet Dewey, for example. My folks never got to meet Dewey Redmond. They talked to him on the phone, but my aunts actually got to meet Dewey. You know, and they just loved him. He was funny. He, they picked he picked us up after this long European tour, and we drove back to to Brooklyn. I was living in Brooklyn at the time, and Dewey was in the car with my aunts and, and my aunts, my aunt Marilyn and Carolyn, they're twins. They just loved that. They thought that was great. And my kids really dig it, you know. My kids, my kids, my oldest, my oldest uh, is my daughter. She's 21. She goes to University of Hartford. She's a musical theater major. She's grown up around this stuff all her life, and so are the boys. You know, my triplet sons, they're 18, Max, Henry, and Ethan, and they just, you know, they just know these guys, you know. So they see them. I remember one time we were playing on Father's Day at the Jazz Standard with the Lee Conus Nanet, and they were pretty small. And uh, they asked Lee a lot of questions. They were really into cars. So they're like, what, kind of, what car did you come here? What car do you have? Well, I don't have a car. Well, how'd you get here? We took, I took a taxi. Well, what kind of car was the taxi? <laughs> and he goes, I got to move my food over here. <laughs> so, so afterwards, afterwards uh, Lee bent down to, to my son Ethan and said, did you, did you, uh, what, what, oh, what did I play? And, and, and Ethan goes, and this is, I kid you not, Joe Lovano was standing right here. He'll, he'll attest. He said to him, uh, he said, what do, I, what do I play? And, 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 and Ethan looked at him and went, you play alto saxophone, and I love you, man. He said. <laughs> <laughs> and Lee didn't know what to think. It was great. He's like, and I love you, man. So, and I knew at one time when I was driving my daughter to school and the great Thelonious Monk composition, We See, came on, and my daughter sang the bridge along with, 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 with the Monk's quartet. And I was like, okay, I'm doing something right. Wow. And, uh, you know, when they, they know Joe Lovano. Joe Lovano was like one of the first civilians that saw the kids. We went to a party at Cameron Brown's. You know, we still talk about that. We brought them out. You know, they were small, you know, six, five months old. We brought them to this party, and they were there, and, the lead, and Joe's down there with them. And then they, they like John Schofield. I mean, they, they're, they're fans. So that's, I'm, I think I'm just as happy that they're going to be fans as they are, you know. Yeah. But my daughter will be. She's a, yeah, she's, she's really got that vibe. She's got the entertainment vibe. You talk about it. You just said the word entertainment. And, uh, you know, in the past, I've been to some wonderful, wonderful jazz shows. I've been to some jazz shows where it seems like there's a, a little, bit, little bit too much of a pattern. You can sort of <laughs> feel and know in advance what's going to happen. And very often I, I hear you mention about sort of breaking the safety zone and that being one of the things that, that can pull an audience in. You know, when you're playing, what 
how do you how do you push that borders how, uh, those borders how do you push those parameters and and you know how important is that for entertaining for bringing an audience in it's an offering and receiving thing i mean you're offering and receiving with people on the bandstand you're offering and receiving with an audience so you know i don't think there's anybody that's going to deny that they don't dig that i mean it, of course you, you something out there and people give it back you're like man this is great that's why we still you know that's why we do these crazy things to get there and to play you know and they're like my good friend charlie cole used to, and i said this right before i came out here it's like we play the same whether we play for five or nine but anyway uh <laughs> i think I, I think it's a lot about being gracious and i don't and, and i never have really changed anything that i do i will never if i'm playing in new york tomorrow night in South Dakota last weekend and Nebraska or whatever next, I I would never do that. That's not fair. Yeah. You know, that's dishonest. Yeah. You gotta be honest. You can't oh we gotta go out and do this. This is what the people are gonna like. Oh. So I think what a lot of times what for me is is that and also is being yourself and also the imagination about presentation. Like what you're talking about. When it falls into a, this is supposed to be rebel music and it's become kind of like predictable. And I, I don't want it to be that. And I don't, think, I don't think we have to change it. I don't think we have to mix it with this or do this sometimes necessarily. It was just done really well and, 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 and honestly, and then it's, then it's going it's gonna, to it's gonna reach people. I think vulnerability is a strong word. You've got you, you to make yourself vulnerable. People will let in if you're vulnerable. If it's too, if it's too whatever, you, know, you, don't, you don't get let in. You know, one of the questions I get a lot of times is, oh, you know, a lot of humor in your music. Yeah, because if you can make people laugh, you can make them cry. If it's the same thing all night, <laughs> you know, it would be like the same tempo or the same volume the whole night. But if you play something that makes them laugh, you turn around and bring something back that is poignant, you're going to get them a lot easier than if it's just the same, you know. And um, so, yeah, and I, I, I realized a few years ago that why, why don't we think this way, you know? I mean, why, when I s see, I was really moved one night at, when one of the last nights at David Letterman when Lady Gaga was performing at Roseland Ballroom. Across the, they went across, they took the audience across the street. And the first tune, man, that was just, you know, it was basically just a band playing and she was singing. It was really, really great. The second tune was all this dancing, all this stuff going on. Like, why can't we do this? That's why I love Esperanza. You know, there's drama. You know, there's like stuff going on. You know, there's people putting thought into what they're doing. Joe Lovano is great. Joe Lovano is one of the greatest performers for this music because he thinks about the set. You know, he gives it, he, it's, a, it's a journey that you're going to go on. It's not just like, oh, look at us, we can solo, you know? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I love that too, but I like bands and I like presentations. So if you have that, I mean, again, musicianship is key, but musicianship on its, you know, you, you've got you've to say something. You know, you've got to, and, and if it fails, you know, you just try something else. I mean, it's not, I mean, we're, nobody's going to get hurt. You know, we're not right. we're not airplane pilots or or surgeons. So I mean, you know, if you make a you do something that doesn't work, you just try something else. You know, but uh, yeah, I, I put a lot of thought into it. You know, the hunting and salt thing, for example, I put a lot of thought into just the way the stage was going to look. Christmas tree. Tired of last year. We might bring it back, but. We made a spoof of It's a Wonderful Life and the Christmas story, you know, the one about the kid getting the BB gun. We remade those, and we played them for the set, you know. I mean, why not? And they freaked people out. They didn't know what to do. Like, well, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not going to not do this stuff. If I thought of it, I'm going to try, you know, we're going to think about it. And the thing is, I have people that's, that, that will do it. That's the other thing. I've, got, I've gained the trust of these people, and that you've got to have a village to help you. And if you don't have those people, so my buddy Jeff Letter, for example, he's my cat, you know. He's, I have that third cup of coffee, and I call him up, I go, let's do this, you know. <laughs> let's do this. So, you know, okay. he's great for that. And you've got to be doing, you've got to be doing it for yourself, I imagine, and enjoying what you're up to and what you're doing to be your best for the audience, too. You've got to be getting into, you know, getting into what oh, you're putting yeah. out there. Yeah. yeah, and I don't, I don't repeat, you know, I don't. I try not to. I don't do a. I don't have a shtick per se. You know. I mean, I. I'm always. I. I, am, I mean, the whole night, the whole 
whole experience is improvis improvisation for me, not just the, the you know, the whole thing. Wait, everything, that's a part of it. You know, I think I really do, and I, and I treat that very, I was very serious, I'm very serious about that part of it. I really am about how, you know, and how we are presented and how we, you know, and, my, and how the musicians are, tr you know, get a chance to express themselves. So I really put a lot of thought into that, really a lot of thought. This is kind of a kind of a compound question. It relates a little bit to to what we're saying here. But when you're out on the road and you're you're sort of road testing material, do you do you road test material? For instance, when you when you're thinking about putting a new project together, you road test first. Do you go in the studio first? And and this combines with the idea that just to sort of let the audience and our, our listeners in on the idea. Yeah, as a drummer. How how much when you're working with other musicians, especially on an album like Honey and Salt, where there's so much wonderful, I mean, all the albums, there's so much wonderful melodicism. But as a drummer, how are you uh, feeding into the compositional aspect, of the melodies, and or are you coming in with some some melodic, solid melodic ideas, you know, written on other instruments? It's 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 uh, Tony. It's, it's a combination of all of it. I mean, it just depends on. On what it is, sometimes we we test this. Like for example, the hunting the salt music is, has been over a, a long period of time. I mean, I received the grant from Chamber Music America in two thousand one, right after my boys were born, and you know that came in handy because I had you know some time to write the music and or you know hire people to watch the kids or something. Where I could write a little bit, but um, sometimes it's road tested. Some of it I like not to, you know. I like to get first impressions. You know, it's a lot of times. Matter, matter of fact. I think sometimes versions come f the way versions come from the first time you play something. Yeah. When I when I record somebody, sometimes like the the what I play the first time may be the way I play that song. I mean, as an orchestration wise, for the rest of the time, what that symbol choice, that feel, because it worked, and my instincts were I trusted. So if I trust my instincts, if I don't think too much, you know, I'm pretty good at first takes and third takes. Second takes for me are kind of like, <laughs> but f the first one, you know, I. I go for something, and, and usually I, I kind of stick with it. Same way with the records. I very f I do my records fast, man. I don't believe in, you know, because when you find a zone, you keep going. And so sometimes you have to, you know, brass instrument or a vocalist, you know, in the case of Dawn, or, you know, sometimes you have to give a little bit of, you know, you have to give people a little bit of a break. But I like, I don't, once you find the zone, you know, um, you just keep going. And, and, uh, and I, I, I love it. You know, I, I love doing, I love to record. I love that whole feeling of it, you know, and and it's fun. I mean, and and but but yeah, I sometimes and then other times we do. We go out and work the, we try the music out, and we workshop it as we say, and then and then we record it. So it can go both ways. Some each band has done its own way of doing it, you know. So right, right. different for each time. Just sort of a couple of questions, just kind of taking it outside the jazz world for a moment. Can you can you talk about some of the the non jazz musicians that you've been inspired by? Maybe mention some of the musicians that are out there currently performing outside of the jazz world that you respect and enjoy and maybe glean things from as a musician. Oh, well, you know, you you you, you have music that you um, grew up it with as a kid. Always, you know, you can't ever, you know, that's your story. You know, everybody has a story, and a lot of your story is the music that you heard. For me, I was lucky. It was like radio was great. And still one of my best friends is the radio because I don't have to decide what to listen to. But I liked a lot of things, you know, and I still do. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm intrigued by, I, I'm, I like something that, 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 that seems to not be, not be the second phase of something, you know. And there's always the pioneer, then there's always a bunch of people that sort of follow that. So when you get these people that are okay, they they did this and uh, first, and you try you know you check that out. So you're always sort of searching for some people that are maybe you're, you know, getting into something slightly different. I can pinpoint a lot of things. Uh, um, uh, I know, I know when I heard Miles Davis record working in steam, and that influenced me in a lot of ways as far as the jazz thing. But at the same time, I was getting into like a lot of funk for, and and. What was known and when I was a kid as new wave music that was really great, like the Talking Heads, and I'm still a big Talking Heads fan, and I loved um, a lot of a lot of R&B music that was from the '70s. You know, just the grooves. You know, Kim and I were listening to 
Billy Paul the other day singing Me and Mrs. Jones. Oh, I remember that. I remember that summer. And I remember the summer of Rock the Boat was a hit, oh, the Hughes yeah. Corporation. Ah, Corporation. Yeah, and, 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 and I, so I was just kind of into, into all of that. And, and, and Parliament Funkadelic was big, especially Bootsy Collins' solo records I really dug. But I had really great influences. My brother, again, my brother Mark was probably one of the greatest influences as far as turning me on to music. He's the one who brought home the Sonny Rollins record and said, you got to listen to this. Al Foster, you got to listen to Al Foster, he said. He just sat me down and said, you got to listen to Al Foster. <laughs> so I did, and, and I played that for a student of mine the other day, this particular record. But, um, you know, I still, I, I, you know, it, David Bowie's fame comes on the radio, I always listen to it. When Beast of Burden by the Rolling Stones comes on, I always listen to it on the radio. I always, because just the snare drum sound. Just, just the snare drum sound. Man, Charlie Watts. You know, when, uh, when uh, Back in Black comes on by ACDC, I always listen to it. You know, when, when, uh, when uh, uh, Sex Machine by... <laughs> It's a James Brown comes on, or any of those James Brown things. And Aretha, we saw Amazing Grace the other night. Oh, man, if you guys haven't seen this movie, oh, go. I mean, it is just unbelievable. And she's unbelievable. The band is unbelievable. But this guy, Alexander Hamilton, who conducts the choir, wow. You know, I like Broadway musical music. I love Johnny Cash. You know, I love uh, George Jones. I went to the Johnny Cash Museum in Nashville last year, you know, and uh, and I've gotten to meet some rock guys. You know, I got, I was, I played with Elvis Costello with with these orchestras, and and you know, I remember when Elvis was on the on on the on Saturday Night Live when he went to Radio Radio. And it's so great to be around that that kind of spirit too, you know. So yeah, I've been pretty fortunate to to meet s some of those folks and and and. Be around, and I'm always in, and I like I like Britney Spears. You know, it freaks my voice out when I say that, but I like her. You know, and and I like um, uh, Rihanna, and I like I, I really like Missy Elliott. As far that that's kind of my era of hip hop more than now, but I, I'm 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 giving it a chance. You know, I kind of you know I'm, I'll give it a chance if it's imaginative. I'm into it. You know? Going the other way, we've got you probably have some listeners and some some folks who are not necessarily jazz listeners, so. Taking it as Matt Wilson, the music band, some advice for our non-jazz listeners out there. Can you think of either three pieces of music or three artists or any combination in there that would sort of be the something that, that would open their minds and their ears to, to the idea of jazz? Well, today's is would have been his 120th birthday. Edward Kennedy Duke Ellington would be a, you know, I mean, there's, to me, Man, a day without, I mean, the day of listening to, any day you get to listen to Duke Ellington's music, it's a great day. You know, Louis Armstrong, I mean, just as a spirit, you know, I mean, just amazing. M Miles, you know. I, what I always just tell people is to find something that sounds in you, you know. I love Ornette Coleman, for example. Ornette Coleman, Don Cherry, I mean, I'm kind of part of that lineage, you know, I'm, I'm th that family tree, and I'm forever grateful, you know, because of, Playing with Dewey for that many years, playing with Charlie Hayden for that many years. You know, I mean, wow, so great to be, you know, just to hear that music. And I don't know what it is that did it, you know, and why why in the middle of this cornfield in Illinois did, did this happen? You know, I still wonder about it all the time. Like, wow, you know. But y you got to be from somewhere, you know, and, uh, and, and, and I think I heard that music, and I think... There's something about the wide open spaces out there too that influences, you know, the time feel. We talk about it all the time. There's a Midwestern time feel. There's an East Coast time feel. It's a little more aggressive. You know, West Coast is like, you know, no, but <laughs> it's all great. You know, it, it all it all it, it all lends itself. And um, but it's great. You know, my years in Wichita too was a different kind of thing. It was like the Southwestern kind of vibe more. The blues. I played in like a lot of these blues bands and jump blues bands and and like rockabilly kind of bands and stuff like that. That was a real influence, you know. Learning all about that, learning the ba how the what the baseline was on, you know. I remember this cat showing me this baseline. So on Honey and Salt, on uh, We Must Behave, you know, the one that John Schofield reads. They rip off, but 
influenced by Bo Diddley. And, and, and I remember this guy telling me that the bass lines for those is, is boom, a do da do da do boom, boom, da do da 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 do da 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 do da 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 So those kinds of things that I absorbed from these people were great. I worked with this great big band leader in Wichita where I learned all the American songbook tunes. Newt Graber was his name. He was called the Jazz Cowboy. Man, he was so influential, you know? He could sing. He played, he played keyboards. He walked bass. And he could play valve trombone all at the same time. Well, he didn't do the play valve trombone and sing right. at the same time. But, but he was great. And I learned all the American songbook, you know, a lot of long, uh, great American songbook tunes playing that gig. And also a lot as a kid playing those tunes, you know? But I, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I adore that world, too. I love Gershwin, Harry Warren tunes, you know, uh, Irving Berlin, you know. Uh, I love I love that music. It was just the the, the, the the majesty of the the of the lyric and the the melodies and the and the harmony together. Cole Porter, I mean, come on, that's that's just beautiful music. So that world too, that was a really big influence. And I still really love the American Songbook a lot, Rogers and Hart and and um, and all that. Just the again, just the the, the 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 marriage of the words and the you know Stardust, for example, Hoagy Carmack, one of the greatest songs ever written, right? And I, there's this Frank Sinatra version that I really lo love where he, he just sings the verse. And I always talk about how the, this thing you know, finish your note, follow through. So Mr. Sinatra at one point sings, uh, high up in the sky the little stars shine, always reminding me that we're apart. <laughs> and that is one of the greatest things ever. Just how he finished that note. Like, wow. So, you know, John Coltrane, too. We, we, we think about all the uh, big picture things, but, you know, the, what I call the frosting. We take the frosting, but the, when you get into the cake, you know, what, how great, how great Mr. Coltrane played a melody. You know, how great he blended with other horns. More than just, oh, yeah, the, you got to dig into what, you know, what else, the, you know, their whole roots of what they were doing. And. So it's, 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 it's a lifelong journey of just being excited about it, you know. Speaking of the, the lifelong journey, one of the last questions. What do you feel that you personally still need to explore as a musician and an artist? Is there just one, one thing that you can pinpoint and say, this is where something I want to do? Many years ago, I was with uh, Lee Konitz, and we were backstage, and it was around his 75th birthday. He, he just turned 91, the great alto saxophonist. We were backstage at the, at the, uh, in East, East Hampton at the club there. The, mm, I can't remember the name of the club. Dennis Irwin and myself and him. And he said to me, you know what I want to do in my remaining years? And this was you know, a long time ago. I said, I don't know what, Lee. And I thought it was going to be all this stuff of grandeur. He goes, I want to just keep doing what I'm doing and do it better. And I thought that was a really great thing. Like, just keep improving. You know, like, keep, again, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really need to add, elect, for me, uh, electronics or this or that. I just like, man, if with, with these people, just keep finding people that I find intriguing and grow with them or find new people that I find intriguing and bring them in. But I think if I just keep exploring with those people, that's kind of my goal, I think, is just to keep, there's still some people that I haven't got a chance to get in the pool with you know, or the sandboxes we say, and so I'm trying to have that happen, facilitate that. But I'm I'm really lucky that I've got to play with veterans of this music and apprentice with them. I played with my peers, I played with the people in between, and now I'm playing with a lot of young people. So you know, I really dig that where I'm getting all this influence you now of of all these different situations. You know, again, it goes back to the people. It's really, it's about the people for me. Those relationships, all relationships. You know. You create these relationships, and you keep those. You know, it's great to say to somebody, "We've been playing together for thirty years." And that, I mean, I, that wasn't that long ago. I could, I couldn't say that because I was only twenty. You know, so <laughs> that was most of me. Not funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tough crowd. Uh, no, but you know, but that I love that. You know, I mean, like Ted, Ted Nash, for example. I met Ted Nash when I was fourteen years old, playing with Louis Belson. You know, we've been we've known each other for that long. And now we've been playing together. On I just played on a couple records of his and recently, and we did something else collaborative. And yeah, I mean it's great to say that you know I've been playing with some people for 
you know, 35, 20, you know, 25, 30 years, that's cool, you know? So that's a great thing to get to do, just to see what we can keep doing with those relationships. All right. Well, before we, uh, we take a few questions from the audience, we, we've gotten to something that we call the down and dirty dozen. This do I get to say my favorite swear word? No, <laughs> Sorry, Nana. Well, Cover Nana. We've had a little variation okay. on it because it's a library. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few. You can mouth it if you want. All right. Let's let me let us know the first responses that come into your mind to the following. Okay. What is your favorite word? Joy. What is your least favorite word? Hate. What turns you on? <laughs> flow yeah what turns you off Some, being closed Pe just closed situations you know where people yeah so it's kind of the opposite the flow to me is a big thing you know flow with anything is great you know? flow with food flow with whatever mm. flow with a lot of things what sound or noise do you love Laughter. <laughs> Who is your favorite fictional hero? Batman. All right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Who is your favorite non-fictional hero? I mean, someone who is alive, you know? Uh, I have to say my brother Mark, I think. Cool. Yeah, he was great, you know? He's turned me on to a lot of things. He was great. Yeah, good. good hero. I think everybody would agree. I think you know between yeah, Lisa and Mark. But yeah, it was because I grew up. You know, you like he just fostered me to a lot of different things. So I say it would be him. I've broken these up. What sound or noise do you hate? I I, I loud motorcycles. Oh. I don't know. I just think it's one of the most selfish things in the world, you know? I'd like to just have a symbol ready at any given time. <laughs> and just drive, pull up next to him, just... <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what that is. It, it's just so... Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I don't... I, young mean, ambulance, you know, sirens, they're kind of meant to be, you know? Yes. Siren serves a purpose. Yeah. It's not one of my favorite sounds, but it serves a purpose. Subway train, you know, they can't help that. That's an that the oil, you know, they need the tracks need oil. I don't know. Brakes, that's not that but but that you know, it's just I don't know. There's just something about it. I just you know ugh. Uh, yeah, I don't like motor I like motorcycle sounds. This might be the same answer to this question. What makes you want to swear? Oh, <laughs> Well, my kids are older now, so uh, uh, you know, I think I, I think one of the things is is complacency. You know, like people that just uh, like I don't like the word just and a lot and almost. You know, not that that makes me swear, but I like people that 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 try. You know, that want to tr even if they fail. You you try to do something, you and you and you follow through with it. I think I also again cl being closed. You know, I mean people that. Uh, but I, I, and also just selfish, I think someone, that all kind of ties in together, I think. Sure. I mean, again, getting back to the most of the, the selfishness, that just kind of makes you want to swear. And I can do it. I'm from Wilson. I can swear. <laughs> I come from a long line of good swearers, you know. But I, we had this v veterinarian as a kid named Doc Hoymey. He'd come out. Doc Hoymey was funny. He'd go, he'd say to my brother and I, Mark, he'd go, you know, your grandfather, when he swore it was like poetry. <laughs> Something to be proud of. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Um, what profession other than yours would you like to undertake? English teacher, winemaker. Cool. Nice combination. What profession other than yours would you absolutely not want to undertake? Uh... Motor motorcycle repairman. No, um, <laughs> wow, uh, I can think of that. Um, I would not want to. I would. I would not want to work at a veterans hospital because I, 
was with you know or or a nurse that has to be in those situations i admire those people so much i mean yeah. i wouldn't want to do it but i admire them so i've been around it you know i went went through it people that have to you know a maternity nurse or something like that but to be someone that has to deal with and their their uh fortitude for that i have to really i mean i admire it it's something i admire but i wouldn't want to do yeah. more you know it's not like you know plumbers all that that's cool you know but i mean that like oh that's all great but that 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 would be no not for me all right finally if heaven exists what would you like to hear saint peter say when you arrive at the pearly gates swinging man <laughs> with a capital w <laughs> beautiful well, I, uh, I want to thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. And if, is it all right if we open the sure. floor up a bit to any questions that may be out there for, for Matt Wilson? Anyone? Okay, over there. Tell them. The question being, what is it that a drummer adds besides rhythm? Gentleman saying he saw a band where they switched instruments when the drummer stepped away and someone took their place. It all kind of lost the energy. So what is it that a drummer brings in? One of our the pioneers. You know, the, the thing about the drum set that we should be proud of as Americans is that it's an American instrument. And it, and it represents... It represents our culture. It's a melting pot of instruments. It's, you know, the, it, 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 we, we know what the drum set is, but it, it's individual. You know, you can have ten toms, you can have whatever. So one of the pioneers of our instrument is a, 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 was a gentleman named Warren Baby Dodds, and on, and on these recordings he made called Talking Drums, he said, "Drummer with a band with no spirit ain't no band." So you got to have that spirit. You know, you got to be like. You can, you've got to be fearless. You've got to be. And you've got to have, it's got to dance. You know, it's got to have this, you've got to have a physical friendship with the instrument. And when you have that, that's why when people sit down, you know, uh, it's, they can play the, they can play the, 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 what's supposed, you know, the sound of it in a way, you know, the, what's supposed to be this, the hi-hat and the snare wow. drum and this, but they don't have the, they don't have that dance that people have. It's like a, you know, a, how a baseball pitcher is or how Serena serves, you know, you know, all that. They have that, they have that dance with it that, that's very special. So I think that's what it is, you know. And it's true with all the instruments. I'm not just putting it on the drums. You know, when somebody picks up, you can tell when they have that kind of friendship with the instrument. You know, Sonny Rollins with the tenor saxophone, you know. You didn't see, you know, when I would see Sonny Rollins play, you didn't see Sonny Rollins, he's still with us, but not playing. But when, you, when I saw Sonny Rollins, I didn't see Sonny Rollins with a saxophone. I saw it as one person. You know, same way with Dewey. Man, his relationship with that instrument was like, that. he was home. You know? So I think that's the thing about the drums. There, there's something about being home there and that dance that people give. And turn, p watch some folks play, you know, on, uh, on film or on video and turn the sound down. And just watch the flow. And you'll see. You know, I was watching, speaking of Mr. Roach, I was talking to Cecil Bridgewater about that today. Just to watch Mr. Mr. Roach yesterday just compose. Just watching him, the joy of watching him see this music emerge, you know. He wasn't, he wasn't doing any of this, you know. But all of them, Keith Moon, you know. I was just watching some videos of Keith Moon, just like how he played in The Who, you know, just a physical way. Turn off the sound and watch it. You'll see that dance, you know. Then associate it with the sound after that. That's, that's, a, great, that's a great idea. Yeah. I love the, the dance of it is, wow. is key. The contours of it, you know, yeah. like the contours of how folks play. Great person that we love is Mel Lewis talks about that. Yeah, sorry, Kim. Do I have a question? Okay. Yep. The question is that um, Matt's just been coming off of the great success of Honey and Salt. What is the next project, or is it? Too soon to think about that, coming off of touring and playing for that album? Well, y uh, y well, uh, no. We've talked about this, though, of just these. I, I'm, I'm, I, I just played with the quartet, which is 
I call, refer to as Matt Wilson Quartet. I say the quartet. But that's Kirk Knuff, Young Cornet, Jeff Letterer, Chris Lightcap on bass, and myself. We played in Philadelphia about a month ago, a little over. We haven't played for a while. And I brought some new music. We played at Temple University. And I brought some new music with us to play. And we looked at it, like literally just read it down, or looked at it right before this workshop. And then we played it for this workshop. And it just came to life. Like, And, and the great saxophonist, uh, um, Sorry, uh, uh, t Tim, Tim, uh, oh man, teaches at Temple. Oh man, sorry, Tim, I'm tired. But he plays with Terrell a lot. I was there because Terrell wasn't, Terrell Stafford wasn't at the school that day. Just said, man, this is a band. There's bands and then there's bands, you know. Tim Warfield, excuse me. Great guy, you know. And, and, I, and I, I knew that, and I felt that that anyway, but I was like, man, this is, this is special. You know, we got to do, I, I, so I'm going to take them in. I'm going to try to do a band with some young people. And I have a dream project that I'm trying to get scheduled with a veteran that I don't want to disclose, but I, I, I want to do it because I have to do this, you know. So that's one. So I'm going to kind of do, I, I've kind of taken a little bit of hiatus from this, a little bit of the recording, but I think in the next five or six months I'm going to do a lot. I'm going to do a duo recording with uh, Kirk Konefke. I'm going to try to do a bunch of different things. So, yeah, I'm going to try to just do a bunch. That's great. That's great. Question back there? question is, is the music industry on the whole possibly a bit more complacent, and what are the possible contributing factors that would or wouldn't contribute to the complacency that's, that may be in the music industry? Well, there's a, a very uh, insightful question, young man. I, I think... I think there's always going to be people that are going to be innovative, you know? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody wakes up and, you know, says, uh, you know, pick up dry cleaning, uh, buy cat food, uh, you know, water the lawn, be uh, innovative. <laughs> I think that's something that you don't even know that you're doing that in a way. I think some people do wake up, though, and go, maybe perhaps they do. I mean, for everything I say, there's always the opposite. I don't know. I think partially, uh, I mean, I just heard a statistic this morning about my sons work at um, AMC movie, and one of my sons had to work till twelve thirty last night because of the new Avengers movies. You know, so again, I haven't seen them. I don't know, but they're worried that 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 the that the big companies are only going to make these kinds of movies because that's all that's going to draw and make money for them. So we're not going to have romantic comedies. We're not going to have this and that because it's only that. Yeah, I have to say it's disheartening. One of the reasons that about the recording thing that's a little disheartening is. In a way, because I've grown up with it this way. I grew up like when people bought your recordings at concerts. And I used to look at an audience and see a lot of people and go, oh, tonight I'm going to probably sell 50 copies of a record. And we sell five. And Or I heard someone say at a table uh, at a Honey and Salt concert, go, that's just easier for me to listen to it on YouTube. And I'm like, you know, it, my sons that need that like sneakers – I wish I could just go to the store and get them, you know, but I have to buy them. So, that, but that we've kind of buried ourselves in that thing too. I'm not really going to get started on that because I, again, I just move ahead. But I think that I believe that that the the spirit of imagination and creativity is always going to be people that uh, that are going to pioneer. And I think there's probably something happening as we speak. There's probably something brewing in New York City as we speak that could really be that. It could be this young person I heard last week in South Dakota, you know. It could be any of these kinds of things if, if, a, if a chance allows it to be fostered. And I think live music will never be replaced. My brother Mark used to refer to Elvis as human moments. Human moments will never be replaced. We can, we can look at the Louvre online, but it's not the same as going there, you know. You know, you can, you, you know, I mean, uh, you've got it. You've got experience. You can theater. You know, you go to see the live theater. You go see, you know, this and that. Uh, so I think what we need to do is, I call it, you know, pr a sort of welcome people or encourage people to be good cultural citizens. 
What I say anymore is you don't have to really purchase the records, right? That's fine. But show us love some other way, like perhaps attend the concerts, you know, be uh, at some sal- – and there are a lot of people that really are. So I think that's going to help foster um, that kind of uh, uh, of energy that will allow that. You need – what we talked about earlier, we need the offer. We need the offering and receiving. And if you don't get the receiving, you don't, you're not quite sure of what you're doing. And not that that should dictate it, but it does give you encouragement that, like, wow, you're doing something. And they may be going like this. I played a concert once at a library like this. It was in Long Beach years and years ago with Charlie Colas' band. And I love this. This was great. This was really great. Two older ladies were leaving, and one looked at each other and said, I really enjoyed that. I don't mean to be with an old lady voice, but it's a nice one. And, and the other person said, I hate it. I hated it, she said. <laughs> <laughs> we succeeded. <laughs> because we could have very well done something that was, and they would have walked out and said, let's go get coffee, and never talked about it again. So you want to also push them, you know? I, I played a concert. I, I led an all-state band or an all-district band in Iowa in the early part of the year. And I took, we took these, I took these kids on a journey, man. This stuff went all over the place. And this gentleman came up in bib overalls, and he said, he ain't never heard anything like this before, but I sure loved it, he said. Wow. Cool. And, you know, again, you know, I think... Honesty, you know, if you just go out. So I think honesty is honesty will will trump the bad word. <laughs> honesty will overcome complacency. You know, I think. <laughs> boy, that was a. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. Yes, sir. I think that will. I think that will do. It. I, 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 I'm a, I'm an optimist. You know, I always think that, that it's going to be happening. You know, I think it's always going to be good. And I think if we just keep pushing, it'll be good. Yeah. A couple of, right there. Go. Have we? Have you scheduled any shows in the near future? All right. This um, is as of as of our date of broadcast. So if folks see this in the future, they know this is. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm as a side person. I am. I'm. I'm a, at. Uh, I'm at Mesro this weekend with Denny's Island with Buster. We're recording live. I'm at Dizzy's on Thursday with Bruce Foreman with Rufus Reed, the great guitarist Bruce Foreman and the great contrabassist Rufus Reed at Dizzy's at Jazz Lincoln Center. And then um, at the end of at, at the um, at in I'm really excited about this. At the end of May, May 31st, at Baldwin High School, um, I commissioned my good friend Jeff Letter to arrange to orchestrate and arrange the Honey and Salt music for Wind Ensemble and Choir. So we're de- debuting that with, they have a really great wind symphony and great choir. So we're debuting that on the 31st. And uh, I'm excited about that. And I'm back in the city in June playing um, with Trio M, which is a collaborative group with Myra Melford and Mark Dresser, two great, great artists at The Stone. And at the end of the month, I'm back at Mezzo with Bill Mays, and we're recording right after that. And then I go to Europe and then to California and all kinds of stuff. So I'm not really around again until the fall. One last question, then I have one more question. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I know Drory very well. Great drummer. Yeah. The question being, why uh, is it that in Europe, jazz music still fills the houses as opposed to here in America, an American art form is, is not playing in, in rooms that are as big? Or as you know, sorry, I think it could, it could, it could kind of go back to what we were talking about earlier about arts funding. If you're educated, and I don't mean educated like that you know what's going on, but if you're, if, if you're welcomed into things, you know, it takes effort. You know, to, to you, we all know we're busy. You know, if you're a parent, you know how it is. It's like, if you can make it, if we can allow people to be welcomed into it easier, then it's cool. But they, they've allowed that over there, you know, over the years. And, and I think that it's, it has diminished a little. I feel it's diminished even in my time of touring in Europe uh, slightly. But still, th- that's sort of like a cultural event to, 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 go to, to go to things. I grew up, you know, my parents, we would just go to do things, you know, take, but, but we didn't, we had three channels, you know, and so, and we didn't have the internet machine, and, 
and all that. So we had to kind of find things to do. So I think that might be part of it. But but I still feel that um, I feel great about how it is in America right now. But I, I still feel that you're right. I, we still love going to Europe and, and the, the appreciation is there. Maybe too because it, it's because it's a music from another land still in a way, even though they have great, great musicians there playing it just like we do around the world. But, you know, it's great to see that, you know, respect. Same way, too, when some great European artists come here, now they're getting some play. European jazz artists are getting more play in the States than they ever have before. So I think that's great, too, along with Israeli musicians, along with Indian music. I mean, great people of all, you know, the sense we're welcoming. Again, we've welcomed this music into a lot of different cultures. So I think th th that's a positive. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a mystery. I think, again, I think it, 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 I think people are just, you know, uh, accustomed to going to do things. And they have these centers there that allow that to happen a lot of times. You know, venues that are very friendly for the music and are supported. You know, so it helps. It's not all about always down to the dollar. You know, it's about a lot of other things. So. I have one last question before we go. What, if any, is your favorite drummer joke? Um. <laughs> oh, um. Let's see, what is it? It's something about the horses in the parade. Is it you? They march in front of the horses, or no? What is it, Christine? You know that one? Okay. Okay. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, I don't pick on the singers too much. I, well, that I was know, a singer joke. That I know better. Good, uh, right? A drummer joke. <laughs> I think I have a trumpet one, but I can't tell it. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I think I think heard all I, of them at this I haven't. Yeah, I, there was one though. There's one recently that I did hear that I think it was something about, you know, they they march in f front of the horses because of you know whatever is going to happen. <laughs> I like to do. I really like the one where they, they make sure that the stage is level, so they doesn't drool out of one side of his mouth <laughs> or her mouth. Go. That one's pretty good. But uh, or you know, it takes five one to screw in the light bulb and four to go. I can do that, but that's <laughs> that applies go. to everybody. That's that's more of a tenor. That's more of a tenor saxophone. But well, I must thank you oh, thank for you. joining no, us for this. You. Thank you guys, Thanks Matt so much. Wilson. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you all for listening and for being part of Inside the Musician's Mind. Again, support live music, support Please. jazz music. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you.